For a long time, it hasn't been clear what could possibly prompt a tech oligarch in this country to apologize for anything, really. Everybody knows that Tim Cook will never say he's sorry about working with sweatshops in China, just like Jeff Bezos will never apologize for, apologize for selling all of the garbage products that these sweatshops produce. And you certainly won't hear Mark Zuckerberg say that he regrets his efforts to manipulate the last presidential election spent hundreds of millions of dollars to influence everything from mail-in voting to the design of the physical ballots that were delivered to voters' homes. And to this day, he, he seems to be proud of it. He also doesn't seem that bothered by Facebook's decision to censor the Hunter Biden laptop story. He certainly didn't release the Facebook version of the Twitter files or anything like that. There was no meaningful mea culpa. Zuckerberg just said that the situation, quote, sucks, and that was the end of it. That's what makes this moment from yesterday's hearing in the Senate Judiciary Committee on online child safety so interesting. After some prodding from Senator Josh Hawley of Missouri, Zuckerberg stood up and apologized to the families seated behind him. And these are families who say that their children were exploited or died because they encountered content on Meta's social media apps, whether that's because they were bullied and committed suicide or because they bought drugs on Instagram or they participated in the blackout challenge and suffocated uh, or they were in child pornography um, or other unspeakable horrors along those lines. And they will, uh, were all there. And, and uh, after being, again, prompted to do so, Mark Zuckerberg stood up, and this is what he said. Who Senator, did you fire? You, yeah, I said you mischaracterized. 37% of teenage girls between 13 and 15 were exposed to unwanted nudity in a week on Instagram. You knew about it. Who did you fire? Senator, this is why we're building all Who these did you fire? Tools. Senator, that's, I don't think that that's... Who did you fire? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to answer that. Um, because <laughs> you mean, didn't is, fire anybody, right? You didn't take Senator, any significant I, I don't action. Think it's appropriate to talk about it, it, like individual it's not appropriate. HR decisions. In, in Do you know who's like sitting that. behind you? You've got families from across the nation whose children are either severely harmed or gone, and you don't think it's appropriate to take a, talk about steps that you took? The fact that you didn't fire a I, single person? To, let me I'm ask you this. Let me ask you this. Took, Have you compensated any of the victims? Sorry? Have you compensated any of the victims? I, These girls, I, have you compensated them? I don't believe so. You, why not? Don't you think they deserve some compensation for what your platform has done? Help Senator, with counseling services? Help with dealing with the issues that your, your service has caused? Our, our job is to make sure that we build tools to help keep people safe. Are you going to platform. compensate them? Senator, our job and what we take seriously is making sure that we build industry-leading tools to find harmful to content, make money. take it off the services, uh, to make money. and to build tools that empower parents. So you didn't take any people. action. But you didn't take any true, action. Senator. You didn't fire anybody. You haven't that's compensated a single not, victim. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. There's families of victims here today. Have you apologized to the victims? I, Would I'm, you like to do so now? Well, They're here. You're on national television. Would you like now to apologize to the victims who have been harmed by your product? Show them the pictures. Would you like to apologize for what you've done to these good people? I, 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 I'm sorry for everything that you've all gone through. It's terrible. No one should have to go through the things that your families have, have suffered. So it's hard to hear exactly what Zuckerberg says there. So here's the quote. I'm sorry for everything you've all gone through. Nobody should have to go through what your families have suffered. This is why we have invested so much and are going to continue industry-leading efforts to make sure that no one has to go through the types of things your families have suffered. Um, now, this is being treated as sort of an unscripted moment. Uh, I, you know, maybe it was, but it's still worth dissecting one way or another a little bit. The implication of what Mark Zuckerberg said is that if his social media platforms had done more, maybe these people's children would still be alive. As carefully workshopped as this apology is, it's still an unprecedented admission from the head of a major technology company. Even though Zuckerberg stopped short of admitting that his products were directly responsible for any deaths, he did convey some, some, at least some sense of remorse to these grieving families. And that's the headline that's been blasted everywhere in the media, as you might expect. But it's important to clarify exactly what Meta is accused of and what Mark Zuckerberg is apologizing for. Last summer, the Wall Street Journal reported that Instagram not only hosts child pornography, but also promotes child pornography through its algorithm. This was a discovery that incidentally did not prompt any kind of sustained advertiser boycott from major corporations, unlike the time Elon Musk agreed with a post that criticized the ADL. But in any event, Instagram was exposed uh, uh, promoting some of the worst kind of content imaginable. 
As Ted Cruz demonstrated at yesterday's hearing, Instagram didn't even block child pornography that its algorithm had identified. And here's how Mark Zuckerberg explained that. Instagram also displayed the following warning screen to individuals who were searching for child abuse material. The, these results may contain images of child sexual abuse. And then you gave users two choices. Get resources or see results anyway. Mr. Zuckerberg, what the hell were you thinking? All right, Senator. Um, the, the, the basic science behind that is that when people are searching for something that is problematic, it's often helpful to, rather than just blocking it, to help direct them towards something that, um, that could be helpful for getting them to get help. In, in what, I also, understand get resources. In what sane universe is there a link for see results anyway? Well, because we might be wrong. We, we try to trigger this, this uh, warning, or we tried to, um, when we th think that there's any chance that the results Okay, you might, might be, be wrong. Let me ask you, how many times was this warning screen displayed? I don't know, but the... But the hey, you don't know. Why don't you know? I, I, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Well, that's a bad enough excuse on its own. Sure, it's conceivable that content that isn't child pornography may have gotten caught up in the algorithmic net, as uh, Zuckerberg is suggesting, but you don't, you don't show the content anyway out of fear of censoring non-child pornography. If you think it might be child pornography, you just shut it down, period. Obviously, that's what you should do. But the problem for Instagram is that even beyond that, for years, they refused to censor even child pornography that was right out in the open. According to the journal, users on Instagram could use hashtags like preteen sex to find these materials, and the platform made no effort to shut that down. It was like a Twitter before Elon Musk bought it, when Yoel Roth was running things, and at most, users would get this little dialogue box, which they could easily dismiss, even when there was no doubt what they were looking for. To the extent that Zuckerberg was apologizing for anything at yesterday's hearing, it was, it was this flagrant disregard for the welfare of children and possibly for the various federal laws against child pornography that his company may or may not have violated. Um, and that apology is long overdue. I mean, that's the least he could have offered under these circumstances, and uh, it's not even close to enough. But to be clear, Zuckerberg was not apologizing for the mental health effects of Instagram and Facebook. You may have heard that he was, but it's not really true. And we can be sure of that because later on in the hearing, Zuckerberg denied that there's any research showing that his products impair the mental well-being of young people. Watch. Mental health is a complex issue, and the existing body of scientific work has not shown a causal link between using social media and young people having worse mental health outcomes. This is the part of Mark Zuckerberg's testimony that underscores why no one, and uh, in, in particular no parent, should ever rely on big tech oligarchs or U.S. senators, for that matter, to safeguard their children on the internet. First of all, you, know, you don't need to look at existing research to know that excessive social media use is bad for children. It's just common sense. You, you can tell intuitively that children who spend hours staring at a screen are going to suffer as a result. Our brains are not wired to scroll endlessly through social media feeds. And typically, when you do things that are extremely unnatural, especially when you're a child whose brain is constantly changing, and it's unnatural, again, to just sit there staring at a screen for hours a day. We're not made to do that as human beings. And, but if you do that, then, then bad things happen as a result. But we don't need research to tell us that because we all know it's true. There's something magical about reliving old family films. As I sit down and press play, I'm transported back in time. The flickering image on the screen are more than just recordings. They are reminders of how I came to be the man that I am today. Thanks to Legacy Box, I can access those precious memories at the touch of a button. You can relive your memories too. Simply create your own Legacy Box filled with camcorder tapes, film reels, and pictures. You get digital copies that can be easily enjoyed, shared, and organized. It's like magic. Legacy Box is the world's largest digitizer. They've helped over one million families relive their wedding days, chaotic childhood sporting events, and even those long road trips. And by going to LegacyBox.com slash Matt, you can enjoy 50% off as well, but you have to hurry. This offer won't last long. Start preserving your past and save 50%. Go to LegacyBox.com slash Matt to get started today. That's LegacyBox.com slash Matt. And putting aside the actual content that kids are engaging with on the internet, ignoring the fact that much of the content is actively harmful and degrading and bad and, and toxic um, and worse, 
Just the very fact that children are spending the majority of their waking hours staring at a little glowing rectangle is troubling enough on its own. You know, if you went up to someone who didn't know anything about the internet, maybe someone who just came here through a time portal from 1920, and you told them that the focal point of life for most children in our culture is a little screen, and they spend almost all their time just staring at this thing, and they care about nothing as much as they care about the screen, that person would automatically recognize that this is a very bad development. No other information is required. In fact, he would go back in, his, in the time machine to his own time period in a panic, having learned that human beings 100 years in the future have become voluntarily zombified. No research required to know that it is bad. But in any event, we do have research, and there's a lot of it. Researchers have demonstrated a causal link between social media use and poor mental health outcomes. It's not just correlation. It goes beyond that. Jonathan Haidt is one of the leading uh, social psychologists in the country. He's at NYU. And here's how he responded yesterday. Quote, Zuckerberg is wrong. There are now dozens of experiments showing causality. I laid out the evidence. And here's some of the evidence. As psychology professor uh, Gene Twang has noted, quote, teen pregnancy, crime, physical fights, and child poverty are all down since 2010, but teen depression doubled. It should have gone down, but it didn't because smartphones and social media led to social isolation and sleep deprivation. It was in the year 2012, the first year that a majority of children in this country possessed a smartphone, that teen mental health plummeted. And you can see, I mean, it's very clear in the charts, like uh, uh, smartphones are introduced and then alongside it, depression and everything else skyrockets. Twang looked at more than a dozen other possible explanations from COVID to the economy, and none of them fully explained what was happening. And you can just look at the charts and see how stark the change is. The chart shows that uh, the percent of U.S. adolescents and adults with major depression in the last year, 2005 to 2021, is from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. As you expect, the graphs for the youth suicide rate look similar. And as far as these researchers can tell, there's no other serious alternative explanation for what's happening here except cell phone and social media use. That's because this phenomenon happens all over the world uh, across varying economic conditions. Everywhere that kids had cell phones, mental health declined. And pretty much at the exact rate that they were getting cell phones. The same pattern played out in five Nordic nations, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Iceland, and Finland. Of course, this doesn't mean that, there, that, that other factors are not contributing in some way to the decline in mental health in this country. The number of Americans who go to church every week has dropped from 70 million in 2008 to 62 million in 2022 and still falling, falling for example. And that's not helping. And obviously, it's not just uh, happening because the iPhone was invented. There's also the rise of victim culture in schools, which teaches young people that nothing is ever their fault. They're always oppressed. They're always a victim. You know, they, they, they're, they're, they've been trained to see themselves that way. As Jean Twang writes in her book, Monitoring the Future, many more young people have an external locus of control, quote unquote, as compared to the 1970s. And that means that they believe that they don't have control over their lives, which is a feeling that leads to higher instances of depression and anxiety. And this is what people are trained to believe these days. So this has been a trend for some time. But again, in the chart, you see a massive spike around 2012 when most young people got smartphones for the first time. And as far as arguments about correlation go, this one is uh, pretty strong. But it gets stronger when you look at the evidence showing causation. And that evidence is also mounting. A study in JAMA Pediatrics, for example, found that regular social media use appears to change the brains of young people. It modifies how they respond to social cues. Quoting from the study, quote, this cohort study examined whether early adolescents' frequency of checking behaviors on three popular social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, was associated with trajectories of functional brain development across adolescents. Adolescents who engaged in high habitual checking behaviors, that is, checking social media, showed distinct neural trajectories when anticipating social feedback compared with those who engaged in moderate or low non-habitual checking behaviors, suggesting that habitual social media checking early in adolescence is associated with divergent brain development over time. The study goes on to state that researchers don't yet know exactly what the effects of this divergent brain development might be, largely because this research is still relatively new. I mean, all this stuff is new. But it does appear, based on all the evidence we have, that social media use is basically rewiring the brains of young people. It causes development that is clearly unnatural and not fully understood. So again, common sense, historical trends, medical research are all pointing in the same direction. 
They're all pointing to the conclusion that introducing kids to smartphones and social media uh, use, especially early on in childhood, could cause, or probably is causing, real and permanent damage. Now, given that conclusion, and the solution is sort of obvious, badgering Mark Zuckerberg at a hearing is not going to solve the problem. And I'm all for having laws protecting kids, particularly when child sex trafficking and pornography are involved. Uh, we need all the laws uh, possible to protect them there. But at a certain point, in addition to that, parents need to be willing to do some actual parenting. Accountability needs to begin not with one tech CEO, or even all of them, but with the millions of parents who give their kids devices with internet access in the first place. According to the New York Presbyterian healthcare system, 42% of kids have smartphones by the age of 10. 42%. And 91% have a smartphone by 14. So that means that almost all kids have smartphones with, with internet access at least two years before society has deemed them responsible enough to operate a vehicle. There is just no conceivable valid reason why a 10-year-old needs a smartphone, especially when dumb phones that only call or text still exist and can be purchased easily and are cheaper. The underlying problem is that most of the parents are addicted to social media too, so they get their kids started on the habit so that it frees up more time for them to scroll their own phones. And that's how the phones have taken over most households. They've become the focal points of most families. That's the root of the problem. But of course, senators can't subpoena millions of parents and yell at them. And that's not going to make a very good television anyway. So instead, we demand performative apologies from tech billionaires for making the dangerous thing that we ourselves are willingly buying and handing to our children. You know, it's a lot like handing your kid a cigarette while simultaneously ranting about the evils of the tobacco industry. In this case, it's, it's tempting to offload all the blame to Mark Zuckerberg, as unlikable as he may be to many people. That's probably why there, are so much, uh, there was so much applause at the hearing yesterday, as Zuckerberg was dressed down by Josh Hawley. But there's now clear evidence that children are suffering while this theater plays out in the Senate. They're becoming more depressed, more addicted to drugs, less self-assured, more anxiety, everything else. And so reliant on smartphones that their brains are, are changing because of it. The solution is not to bully Mark Zuckerberg, even though he's maybe the easiest person on the planet to bully, and I'm sure it is kind of fun. But the real solution is something far simpler, but apparently quite radical these days. The solution is for parents to be parents. Hey, YouTube, thanks for listening to the show. If you'd like access to my full show with no ads, you should go to dailywire.com and use promo code Walsh to get two months free on all annual plans. See you there.